Hello world, welcome to Web Dev Frontiers. My name is Tomasz and I'm here to share my experience with you in WebTech. In this video, I'm going to show you eight things you didn't know DevTools can do. Let's jump straight in. Let's take a look at the first thing, which is going to be in console. I'm going to create an array here. Let's call that names, for example, and add a couple of names in there. Once I have the names variable available, I can just type in console.table and have the array displayed in a nice table-like format. Why I really like this is because I also get the index values printed. Now, of course, this particular solution seems very easy to use, but it's even more useful when you look at some more complex structures, such as an array of objects. So let's take a look at a more complex example. Here is a characters array of objects with Star Wars characters. So I'm just going to add this to my console. And now we can type console.table and just list out the characters from here. And we will again get a nice table overview. So this is very useful for exploring more complex structures. And please remember that you can not only use console.table from within the console, but you could also add console.table as a call in your application as well, and then have some data printed to your DevTools. The second example that I would like to show you is related to the sources panel in DevTools. Now here we have a sample application which has been written in JavaScript. We have a button here that says greet me now. I'm going to click on it, but I just get a single letter back. So something is clearly wrong with my JavaScript code. Now I could go back to my editor and look at the source code, or I could open up the sources panel here, find the two JavaScript files that make up my application, and I could add some breakpoints into that. So let's go into greetings.js as well as main.js to see what's going on. Okay, so it seems that we are randomly picking a greeting from an array, and this is it. Now, obviously, I can already see what the issue is. I have a comma separated list as opposed to an actual array, but let's see how we could actually debug this should the code base be much larger than this. So of course I could add a debugger line on line number five just to make sure that I get a random index and maybe line number six as well. And I can do so by clicking the lines next to the code that I would like to debug. And all I need to do now is refresh the application and immediately I can see on the right hand side that I have both the value for random index and for greetings as well. Now, if I hit the greet me button, you can see that we get this message here, which says pause in debugger and our code execution has now stopped because we asked this line to be debugged. And now we can utilize this arrow here, which steps over to the next function call and we can go through every single line that we have marked to be debugged. Furthermore, we can hover our mouse over this and we can see the actual values that have been calculated by JavaScript. So in this case, random index is going to be 10. And then we see that greetings is hi, hello, and ciao. And we're going to pass random index 10 in there. So this is very helpful to actually get a live view of variables and see how your code is going to be executed. And if we want to resume the script execution, all we need to do is click on this play button right here. Now I'm going to go ahead and update my code. And notice that I have a line in here that says debugger. So I can actually programmatically create a debug point in my JavaScript code. So I'm just going to save this, go back to the browser, get rid of these debug points. And I can do that by again, clicking on the appropriate lines, refresh the app and notice the debugger statement is there. So let's go ahead and click the button and we are now stopping the code execution. So notice random index is not set. So we can step into that function. There we go. So now we will have a value once the math floor and math random values got calculated. So we can hover our mouse over here and we see that we now have random index set to five. And this is also identified here on the right hand side in DevTools. In this next example, 
I would like to show you how you can also debug a Node.js application using your browser's DevTools panel. So notice I have here app.js, which is a very simple Node.js application. And all I need to do now is start up my Node.js application with the appropriate flag so that it can be debugged inside DevTools. So let me type in node-inspect-brk and just call app.js normally. Now notice we have a message here that says debugger is listening on localhost 9229. So all we need to do now is switch back to our DevTools panel, open up a new tab in Chrome and go to Chrome colon double forward slash inspect. And notice we have this button here that says configure. So let's click on that and let's add the IP address of 127.0.0.1 and then the port was 9229 and we're going to hit enter so this port is now added and notice we already have a remote target here which is app.js now i could do two things i could actually click on this link here that says open dedicated dev tools for node or i could click on inspect in this case i'm going to get this particular window opened up and this is now my node.js application and what I can do now, I can add debug points again. So I could, for example, add the debug line here, or I could also in Node.js just add the debugger statement inside my code. Okay, so now we can step through the various function calls. Okay, we now filter through characters. Notice we get access to the individual objects. And sooner or later, we're going to realize that the reason why we are not returning anything is going to be because our affiliation is in uppercase letters whereas we're comparing it with lowercase okay so again we are now debugging a node.js application inside devtools which is really really useful for larger node.js applications next up i would like to show you how to run a so-called coverage test now if you've done some testing in any programming language before or any framework this is not the same test so inside DevTools, a coverage test, essentially shows us the amount of JavaScript and the amount of CSS that is currently being used on a page. And as you can see, there's no such menu item here on top, which says coverage. So we need to bring that up as an additional tool. Notice we have these three dots here. So if you click on that, you have access to additional tools within DevTools itself. And one of them is called coverage. So I'm going to click on that. And that's going to bring up the coverage panel. I'm going to hit this button here, which is going to refresh the page and it's going to run essentially the coverage test. Now I only have some CSS on this page and I can immediately see by looking at the usage visualization column that there's a fair bit of CSS that is not being used on this particular page. Now actually clicking on this URL here, will bring up this sources panel and it's going to give me a view of my style.css file and it's very easy to understand. Essentially, anywhere where I see red on the left-hand side here are CSS rules that are not being used on this page. The green bars are actually being used on the page. Now, the one caveat that I would like you to remember is that the coverage test is very useful, but it only looks at the current page and it doesn't take into consideration things like even listeners. So you may be adding additional elements to a page and you may have some different styles for that, which you bundle into the same CSS style. So coverage is not able to detect those. Also, if you have multiple pages in your application and you have one single CSS file, whatever you've put in this CSS file is only going to be relevant for the current page. So you may have CSS rules that are applicable to other pages, but coverage is going to mark those as unused. So just make sure that you use this tool with caution. What's also really great about coverage, by the way, is that you can also run the coverage test using a script and you can just write some Node.js script to open up your page run a coverage test either for CSS or for JavaScript, and potentially you could create a CSS file or a JavaScript file with only the bits and pieces that are used on a current page. And in order to do that, we need to use a tool called Puppeteer. Okay, I'm going to record a video maybe later on about Puppeteer itself, but very simply put, what we do is we mimic the behavior of 
the Chrome browser programmatically. So what we are doing, we are opening Puppeteer, we are opening a new page, we start the coverage test for CSS, we navigate to localhost 8080, which is where my application is running, and then we stop the coverage test. And then using some code, we iterate through only the used bytes and then save that out to a CSS file called used underscore CSS. So let's actually run this. And let's open up the file. And this is the CSS that is only used on the page. This could be useful for things like creating inline CSS for web performance. But again, just remember what I said, use this with caution. Next, I would like to talk to you about the viewport size. Did you know that Chrome, when you have DevTools open, will actually show you the size of your current viewport? And what I'm going to show you now is the picture element, which uses a source element that displays two images. So if we have the media query that is matching our source element here, we're going to be displaying an image that is 200 by 200 pixels wide. And then as a fallback image, we have another one, which is 500 times 300. So let's take a look at this. Let's say you would like to test this. You, you want to make sure that this particular media query matches and this image gets loaded appropriately. I have the particular page open and notice I have DevTools open as well already. And if I drag the DevTools panel to the left or to the right, notice there is a viewport size that comes up. And I can see that currently my viewport is 1,200 pixels by 15,000. Okay, so all I need to do now is bring this down to 600 and hopefully our image is going to change. So let's go to 600 and there we go. We now have a different image. So this is very useful for testing things like media queries and other things. Notice also this button here, which is a combination of a laptop and a mobile device. And the button is called the device toolbar toggler. So I'm going to click on that. And this allows you to pick from a variety of devices, but also to enter a particular viewport size. And of course you have the drag and drop interface so that you can also change the viewport. But you may not want to test against the mobile device, in which case the viewport is still visible. Other things that you can do here, which are really interesting, is also the fact that you can flip this device. So let's say that you are testing against an iPhone SE and you would like to flip this into a landscape view. So now obviously the viewport size changed and now you get the larger image. So you can do some very interesting things with this using images for different sized devices. In the next example, I'm going to show you another picture element where we have another media query. This time around, the media query specifies a minimum resolution of two DPPX. So first, you're probably wondering, what is DPPX? So DPPX represents a number of dots per pixel. Very simply put, what that media query is doing is going to load a higher resolution image for a device that supports a higher number of dots per pixel. For example, I'm using a MacBook. MacBooks have Retina screens, and Retina screens are actually, I think, DPR3, but definitely they should show DPR2. As a fallback image, I'm showing a DPR1 image. DPR is, by the way, device pixel ratio. Okay, so basically on retina screens, I should be able to see an image which has two times the amount of pixels versus the DPR1 image. But how do you test this? So let's go back to DevTools and I'm, I'm looking at the network panel and clearly I am now loading the DPR2 image because as I said, I'm using the MacBook. So this supports a retina screen and I'm loading the larger image. But how do I test this? How could I test if the, the DPR1 version of the image also gets loaded? And trust me, I've spent half a day on a real life project trying to figure this out, why a DPR2 image was loading instead of a DPR1. As it turns out, inside this particular mobile view that you're seeing, which remember you can enable by clicking on this particular button here, notice you have three dots that allows you to add an option, which is called device pixel ratio. And now we have a dropdown 
And in this drop down, notice that the default device pixel ratio is set to 2.0 in Chrome DevTools. If you change this to one, and now if I refresh this particular example, now the DPR1 image gets loaded. If I change back this to the default and refresh the screen, now DPR2 gets loaded. So this verifies to me that the higher density image is going to be loaded on Retina screens, which is exactly what I wanted. Over the past couple of years, there's been a lot of discussion about Google's core web vitals, which are essentially three metrics that measure the performance of any given site. I plan on making a video about them because they are very, very useful. There are a couple of tricks that I would like to share with you so that you can have a site that performs a lot better. However, have you ever wondered what core web vital score a particular website has? With DevTools, you can very easily figure it out because DevTools allows you to have a so-called Core Web Vitals overlay added on top of any given website. All you need to do is click the three dots in DevTools and select the option, run a command or use the appropriate key combination. And once you have this panel open, just type in Core Web Vitals and notice that brings up an option which says show core web vitals overlay. So I'm going to click on that and immediately I now get the three current core web vital scores for the page that I'm on. And you can do this on any page. And this is very useful for testing an actual live website, or you can use this in your own development environment just to get a feel for how well your site is performing across these three metrics. Now, this shouldn't be the value that you look at because there are much better tools to do this, but maybe that's for a future video. And now to get rid of this overlay, all we need to do is click the three dots again, run command, type in core web vitals, and there we go, hide core web vitals overlay, click on that, and now that's gone. And this last DevTools trick that I'm going to leave you with is one of my favorites. Here we have a sample application that, as you can see, makes a couple of requests for a CSS file, a JavaScript file, a font, and a couple of images. Did you know that if you hover your mouse over any of these while pressing the shift key on your keyboard, you can actually see which request originated from what resource and what subsequent requests that particular highlighted resource has made. So in this example, I have my mouse over app.css and I'm pressing the shift key. So I can, just by looking at the network view here, I can tell that app.css came from network request of HTML because it's green and it subsequently has made two additional requests. It has made a request to a CSS file and the CSS file made a request to the actual font file. Now, if I hover my mouse over the font file, I can see that it came from the CSS file and then that subsequently came from network request of HTML. If I hover my mouse over the JavaScript file, I can see that the JavaScript file was requested by the HTML because it's green and the two JPEG files, because they are red, were requested by this JavaScript file. So this is very interesting to me because it allows me to explore an application really, really fast and allows me to see where particular resources came from, where they originated from, and whether they have made any additional requests. And there you have it. These were the eight DevTools hints that I'm hoping you didn't know about, but I'm hoping that you can add these to your DevTools tool belt. If you enjoyed this video, please give it a like. Also, don't forget to subscribe and I'll see you in the next one.